Another great characteristic of life is the idea of inheritance, or the answering to the age-old question of what makes us who we are, and how is it that our traits are passed on from generation to generation. We now know the answer for this question lies in genetic information stored in DNA. But this age-old question of heredity was not answered in biology terms until the, an Austrian monk called Gregory Mendel spent seven years studying seven characters or properties of pea plants, and studying traits both dominant and recessive to understand understand the patterns of inheritance across many generations. He picked pea plants, by the way, because they grow fast, they have easy traits, and they self-pollinate, or they have the ability with, of crossing with themselves, which makes things a lot easier, as we will discuss in a little bit. And what actually made him curious about this whole dilemma was this particular problem with flowers. Basically, whenever he would get a green plant and cross with another green plant, no matter how many times he tried it, no matter how many different green plants he used, he would always get green peas. And so he realized, of course, this makes sense. Green peas make green peas. Nobody would contest that. Then he tried the same thing with the yellow peas. And the first time he did it, there you go. Yellow versus yellow makes yellow. Okay, that makes sense. But as any good scientist, he decided to try it again and again. The thing is, he noticed that sometimes when he would get a yellow pea and cross with another yellow pea, three out of four times or 75% of the time, he would get yellow peas. But 25% of the time, he would get green peas. And that was really confusing because he had just done that cross with another set of yellow peas. And every time you get yellow peas and he, now he's like confused what's going on and so he tried to come up with a solution for this and he started thinking about the possibility that yellow peas acted different from green peas and then he was trying to find a solution for that so he decided to cross them together then he got a yellow pea and crossed with a green pea and for his surprise every single pea came out yellow now this went against the idea of the time which was the idea of blending theory or inheritance which is the idea that whatever the mother and the father contributed would kind of mix together to make the child clearly this is not blending it's more like one trait dominated over the other for that character and so we understood now that there was no such thing as blending it was more like a dominance relationship where one dominated over the other and here comes the idea of the law of dominance when two traits collide the dominant one is the only one that shows and this is the cross that made him look realize that but as any good science he decides to repeat the cross and again he gets to a yellow pea and another green versus a green pea and he finds out that half the the piece come out yellow and half the piece come out green on the children and he's like what's going on I just did this cross and I'm getting different results trying to understand it cost him seven years of his life and led him to notoriety unfortunately only after he died he became famous for this but the point is he's now one of the greatest scientists in biology and a father of genetics he never actually called the solution for his problems genes but he called them factors later on they will go on to become genes to understand the solution for his problems we have to review the idea of genetic crosses and we do punish squares to solve these things but for now just let's list them the first cross that we can do is when we get the true breeding cross now that's when you get what we call a homozygous dominant or a genotype which is the combination or genetic code that people have and you actually get something that's called a homozygous dominant or someone who has two dominant alleles which are the different versions of a gene and cross with another person just like it every time you're going to get just like it and so this is called a true breeding cross because you get what is a true breeding plant someone who has homozygous for that trait he only has genes that are coding for becoming dominant and so for all the children will be dominant the same thing will be true about a true breeding recessive cross where all you have is recessive alleles or you only have the versions of the genes which code for recessive looks and therefore if you get two plants like that every child was going to be recessive. Now, the first thing Mendel did is to find plants like that, true breeding plants. And we'll talk about it in a second how he actually figured that out. And we also talked about this idea of genes and alleles in a little more detail also. But again, to try and understand his cross, we have to look at the patterns first. The other thing that he did is he got the parental cross, which is when he got each one of those two different true breeding plants or homozygous plants and crossed them against each other. And so he got a homozygous dominant, big I, big Y, versus a, a homozygous recessive, little Y, little Y. And every child of this cross came out a hybrid, which is basically the definition of a hybrid, the product of a homozygous dominant cross with a homozygous recessive cross, or the product of a true breeder versus another different kind of true breeder. And we call this genotype heterozygous because they have two different alleles or two different versions of the gene for color. And so big Big Y, little Y was all yellow. And notice now that this interesting thing, Big Y, little Y looks the same as Big Y, big Y. It looks 
looks yellow. And so there you go, two different ways of looking dominant. And we'll come back to visit this in a second. Then he did an F1 cross. He got the product of the parental cross or the F1 generation, and he crossed them with themselves or with, or with others like themselves and did the F1 cross. And now the result of that F cross, if you actually do the Punnett square, is that one will be homozygous dominant, two out of four will be heterozygous, and one will be homozygous recessive. And that's the F2 generation. It has a one to one genotype ratio. But if you look at phenotypes, three out of the four will look dominant and one will look recessive because the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous both look the same if you're talking about complete dominance. Later on, we're going to throw incomplete dominance into the mix here. Then, just to make sure he knew what he was doing, he got those things and he crossed them with each other and tried to predict what would happen. And that is called the F2 crosses. And the, the F2 cross, you get the children of the F1 cross or the F2 generation and you cross them with themselves to make crosses that haven't been done yet. The first is going to be called the F2 dominance cross. And that's when you get a heterozygous and you cross with the homozygous dominant. And you will get two heterozygous and two homozygous dominants out of each four children of this cross. Now notice that half the parents were homozygous, half the parents were heterozygous in the same ratio is present in the children. But that since homozygous dominant and heterozygous both look yellow, everybody in this cross will look the same. And this cross will be actually indistinguishable from the true breeding dominant cross. Look at the top and you will see what I'm talking about. The other F2 cross is again a hybrid versus a homozygous or a hybrid versus a true breeder. And this is called the F2 test cross. And we'll call, talk about what it's called a test cross later. But basically what they do here is they get a hybrid and they correct with the homozygous recessive. And you also get two that look like one and two that look like the other. And again, just like you had half the parents to be hybrids, half the parents to be true breeders, recessive, again you have two heterozygous children and two homozygous recessive children. So the ratio of the parents match the ratio of the children. And that's the characteristic of any F2 cross. Now when you actually try to understand what was happening with the cross that he was looking at or his problem with flowers, now that you know all the different crosses that there are, you can actually figure out what was happening. Basically, on the first cross he did, he was basically doing a true breeding recessive cross. Compare with the top and you'll see what I'm talking about. Little y, little y versus little y, little y, and every children will come little y, little y. And no matter how many times you would try it, since there's only way, one way to look recessive, that's always the cross he was doing. And that's why he was always getting the result. But the second time what he did, think about it, was a true breeding dominant cross. When you got a big Y, big Y versus a big Y, big Y. And just like before, you get every time big Y, big Y. Now, when he redid that, what he was doing is not the parental cross, but actually the F1 cross. And that's why he was getting 75% that look dominant. Because the result of that cross will be 1, 2, 1, with those first three actually looking dominant. And one, which will look recessive. Now, when he did this, put them together, the first time he did it, what did he do? Well, he's doing a parental cross. And we're getting big Y, big Y versus little Y, little Y, and getting all hybrids, which are all look dominant. But then when we did it, he did big Y, little Y versus little Y, little Y, which was an F2 test cross. And then you get half and half the looks. So the reason why he was getting cross, doing the same thing twice and getting different results is because he was crossing one time homozygous dominance. And the other time he was crossing heterozygous. And so eventually he figures out that there's actually two ways of looking dominant. And that's the key to solve his problem with flowers. But he learned a lot of other things as well. He learned that things don't blend. He also learned that it's possible for a look that disappeared to come back. Look at the F1 cross. Two things that look yellow can make something that looks green one out of four times. How is that possible? Well, that's because every single cross where you have both parents with the recessive carried in the geno genotype, it's actually possible to create the homozygous recessive genotype and therefore the homozygous recessive phenotype, which is the way that things actually look. Check it out. In this cross here, you have two parents which have the recessive and therefore you have the chances of making that genotype. Again, on this cross here, you have both parents having the recessive and therefore it's possible to make that happen and again here and so you see that only when both parents carry the, the recessive allele it's possible to make a, a homozygous recessive genotype in the children and therefore represent with the recessive look so he learns a lot he learns that genes don't blend but they actually separate 
and we combine to form new dominance relationships. And it's not really a blend of mom and dad, but basically a combination of mom and dad with specific dominance relationships that determine what you are. And if one parent is dominant for everything, you're going to look more like one parent than the other. And it also learns that sometimes traits dominate over each other and that it's possible to make a look out of two parents that look the same to make a different look from them. And, and that there's two different ways of looking dominant. But it took him years to figure all of this out as he did cross by cross, little by little. By the way, notice that the second cross where he did yellow versus yellow equals yellow, it could also have been an F2 dominance cross. And this is actually indistinguishable to the true breeding dominant cross because they all look the same. Again, all of this because there's two different ways of looking dominant. Which brings us to that idea. Both the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous looks will look purple. And if you're talking about purple versus white flowers now. And the only way to look recessive is if you have two recessive alleles put together or if they're by themselves. We'll talk about that when we did the chromosome inheritance video. And that who you are is really a combination of two homolog chromosomes paired up together and the allele of one plus the allele of the other and the way they both talk to each other and the dominance relation between them is going to create the actual look that you have. An example of this one here, since you have one purple and one white allele, you are a heterozygous. That flower will probably look purple. That is the discovery that he makes, that there's actually two ways of looking dominant. Mendel will then repeat this process for each one of the seven characters that he looked at when studying the pea plants. And he would control the way the, the flowers cross with each other by removing the male part of the flowers or the stamens and then leaving the female part covered so that he could actually control which pollen went inside of it. The female part, by the way, it's called a carpal. And basically what he would do is he would get the pollen off the stamen of a flower he wanted the pollen to be like, and he would get that brush and move it into the carpal to make sure that the correct seed went inside the carpal. And then he would get the mature pods and plant them to make the next generation of plants. And by doing this process, he generated exactly the crosses that he wanted to, starting with the pea cross, or with true breeders and then eventually getting the children of that, the F1 cross and the children of that, the F2 crosses and so forth. By the way, how did he know he had true breeders? Well, nowadays you can actually do genetic analysis to find out exactly what the genotype of something is. Obviously, he didn't have those tools back in those days. So how did he do it? He did it the other way. He could do a self-cross or self-pollination. Flowers that have both genders in them have the capability of doing that, which is something that pea flowers can do. Not every flower can do this, but pea flowers certainly can. And so basically what he did is he got a flower that was homozygous dominant and crossed it with itself, and then he would find out if it's actually homozygous dominant. Because if it was, every single time it would come out homozygous dominant. And if he did the same thing with a recessive flower, he would know it was going to be recessive because every time it would come out that way. By the way, it was easy with the recessive flower because there's only one way of looking recessive. And once he figured that out, he knew that whatever look was recessive had to be true breeder. Then, what if he got a, a hybrid and he actually got a heterozygous and cross with itself? Now, in that case, you get basically the F1 cross. You're going to get one homozygous dominant, which is what you want, by the way. You want a true breeder. And you get, you get two heterozygous, which puts you back where you started. And you get one homozygous recessive, which is the other true breeder that you want. So still, even when you get a hybrid and cross with itself, it's still... Half the time, you end up generating true breeders. And if you get those and cross them with themselves, you know they have true breeders. So, by self-pollination, you create true breeders one way or another. And so, by keep repeating self-pollinations over and over again, he eventually made sure that the flowers he was working with were true breeders. There is another way, by the way, to make sure some of the genotype of something that looks dominant since you can't necessarily do a self-cross with everything. Think about humans, for example. You can't really do self-crosses. But if someone has a dimple, it could be big D, big D, or big D, little d. You can't tell just by looking at it unless you do a genetic analysis or a self-cross. But since humans can't self-cross, that becomes a problem. But that's where the test cross comes in. That's why it's called a test cross. If you get that and you cross it with something that's a homozygous recessive, for example, little d, little d, someone that doesn't have temples. Well, in the first case, you're actually doing a parental cross, which means every single child will come out big D, 
liturgy. And every single child will have dimples, no matter how many times you try. But if you do the same cross, and half the time you have child, children that ha get dimples, and the other half the time you get children without the dimples, that means that the parent that you didn't know what the genotype was must have been heterozygous. And that's what the test cross is for, to determine the unknown genotype of a, something that has the dominant phenotype.